Welcome everyone to our Port Bridge session for today. Today we've got two presenters on our topic of controlling pests, insects, and rodents. I'm going to read the bios for both of our um, presenters today. Um, first presenting is Roger Moon, who is a professor of entomology at the University of Minnesota in St. Paul. He earned his Bachelor's of Science and Ph.D. in Entomology from University of California, Davis in 1979. His research interests have concerned the biology, ecology, and management of mucosid flies, mosquitoes, lice, bugs, and mites that occur around livestock and people. Roger and colleagues have published more than 130 articles, reviews, and book chapters for scientists and the general public including papers on swine mange and flyborne spread of PERS virus. Roger teaches a course in veterinary entomology for undergrad students in the University of Minnesota's College of Food, Agriculture, and Natural Resource Sciences, and also teaches part of a course in veterinary parasitology for students in his universe, university's College of Veterinary Medicine. Roger has advised 12 students to master's and Ph.D. degrees, and consults regularly with researchers, educators, and practitioners involved in livestock pest management throughout the nation. Our second speaker for today is John Beller. Pest management has been a lifelong passion for John. He started in the industry in 1977 as a service technician with, with a regional pest management group and quickly increased his roles and responsibilities first as a territory manager in the greater Omaha, Nebraska area and later as sales director of the group. In 1987, John first realized his dream of starting his own company and was able to grow his business organically to the point where it was acquired by a leading national organization. John remained aboard and steered the company through a period of growth and expansion before returning to his entrepreneurial roots to develop his company, Beller Biosecurity Strategies Incorporated, in 1992. Today, Beller Biosecurity Strategies has grown to be an industry-leading provider of pest vector strategies to livestock producers through the Midwest and Western high desert areas. John continues to add value to his clients through continuing education, verification, and sustainability. He is a strong advocate for rodent control being an important discussion piece when it comes to biosecurity because herd health and food safety are so important. John is a well-respected and sought-out expert and recently was invited to speak at this year's American Association of Swine Veterinarians Conference. So like I said, John Beller will be our second presenter, but our first presenter for today is Roger Moon, and he will be covering the insect portion. So with that, Roger, I will hand it over to you. Well, thank you, Sarah, for the generous introduction, and Sherry for helping organize this session today. I'm looking forward to um, the next 30 minutes, probably less, uh, covering topics that I think are of interest to your listeners. Uh, I asked you to do a survey, and I heard back from about a half a dozen people um, and uh, three issues seem to rise to their agenda. One was pit gnats, I'm going to call them. The second was mosquitoes and the bug bites that they cause. And then finally, house flies and other flies that can vector pathogens of hogs. So those are the three topics I'm going to talk. And the main points for those of you who are dying to go to sleep after lunch is in slide number two, today's take-home points. Pit gnats are small insects that develop in manure, basically, uh, in confined uh, swine housing. And uh, at this point, we don't have a good control method other than to try to reduce their numbers by managing the pit, and that's done at the time of clean-out, repopulating. Mosquitoes cause bug bites that some packers have to trim, and in turn, uh, the best recommendation we have to prevent that is for hogs that are slaughter-ready uh, to... Uh, put up fly screens to keep mosquitoes out of their housing, um, probably for a month before they're due to, due to hit the road. Finally, house flies and other large flies bother people and, and spread viruses, among other pathogens. And uh, our basic lessons are to manage them by reducing their sources 
exclude them from sensitive areas, and use premise sprays as needed. And of course, monitor your program to see how well it's going and make plans for the coming year. If you move to slide three, I've given you a table <coughs> which lists the different kinds of flies that are common around swine facilities. It's important to know who you're dealing with, and in turn, you know where they come from. And this little table lists the three major groups, the small filth flies, or those, those gnats, those, those pit gnats I talk, I will talk about in a moment. Larger, the filth flies, including the house fly. And then finally, the group called aquatic biting flies. They all come from wetlands of one kind or another. All of these are flies, two-winged insects, and all flies undergo a basic life cycle that's illustrated in slide number four. <coughs> they actually develop through six different life forms. Each time they change, they, they replace their exoskeletons with a new one, and they, they change from eggs to little tiny maggots to larger ones. They form a barrel-shaped kind of a pupa, and then finally the adult fly, male and female. They emerge with wings. The adult fly is the terminal stage. They don't get bigger as they grow and get older. There are no such things as baby flies. Baby flies are eggs or maggots. Okay? Next slide. Uh, number five is a Googleized aerial view of a arbitrary uh, swine raising facility. Uh, and I want to use this to get you to think about where on your property flies could be developing. And in turn, you can think about how to prevent them from doing so by uh, source reduction. Go back to our table of flies. Uh, let's start with the small filth flies. These are the, the, the pit gnats, I'm going to call them. And you can see that they're mainly coming from manure storage systems and perhaps in uh, pens or, or, or barnyards if you have those around your place, outdoor housed animals. These insects are really small. In slide seven, you can see a fruit fly on the left-hand side and a moth fly on the right-hand side. These are small, nondescript insects. They do not bite. They don't cause harm to the hogs that we know of, uh, but they can be a nuisance for workers. Walk in, turn on the lights, and you get a mouthful of flies. Well, you could use a respirator, but maybe you could reduce the numbers and, and, and make for more comfortable employees, too. These pit gnats, as I've described on slide number eight, are actually developing as little tiny larvae in the, in the equivalent of a, of a bathtub ring at the top part of the liquid storage system in, house, in housing that has um, a manure storage system under, 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 under slat floors. These insects are coming up from below and bothering people and, and, uh, in, in, the, in the animal area of the buildings. But they're actually feeding on the scuds that develop uh, either along the edges of the pits or perhaps if there are solids floating in them, uh, they're, they're, they're feeding on, on, on those solids as well. So and I've tried to indicate that in the slide by the orange lines that I've added to the walls of the pit below the flooring or on the solids maybe in that middle, middle section labeled manure pit. These pit gnats in uh, slide nine <clears throat> are really uh, coming from places that we can't get at. And, and in most, most barns that I've been in seen that, that are infested with these insects, there are usually way too many and they're coming out every day it's impossible to keep up with them with some sort of a space spray or a residual insecticide that would be used in the animal room. Much better and long-term solution is to try to reduce the numbers of them that are developing in the sources below. And this, here's the problem that I fight with the ag, the ag engineers. They don't develop barns that you can get in and clean the pits from below. But all we can do is work at the time of clean-out to try to break up those solids. Think about the goo that can be hanging under the slats of the floors of the barn. Try to power wash. Maybe you can get the head of your power washer along the wall and try to knock solids down into the liquids and then get your manure hauler to agitate the pit as best as possible to break up the floaters and then to haul them out at the time that the building is pumped out. Unfortunately, we don't have anything that can be added to the pit that would kill those insects developing there nor do we have anything really that, that works in the, in the animal part of the, of the barns uh, to, to keep up with the adults that are produced. Really, source reduction is the main point, and now focus on that at time of clean-out. I would like to hear with, from any of, of the managers that are on the line in this group, either at question section afterwards or, or later, uh, any ideas you have for how to deal with, 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 uh, with your manure storage system to reduce the numbers of these flies. 
the next slide, which would be number 10, it's not numbered. Um, let's move now to mosquitoes and discuss bug bites. Uh, these are these are um, um, actually showed up in in my knowledge. Uh, my first contact with them was a was a packer in southwestern Minnesota who has now changed hands, um, and they were docking producers ten bucks a head, originally fifteen, and they worked it down to ten for each animal whose carcass needed to be trimmed, and that's caught their attention. So we got involved in studying that problem, and we learned a little bit about it, which I'll describe here. Turns out the punchline is that mosquitoes, we think, are flying in from the neighborhood and they're biting pigs and in turn those mosquito bites uh, cause lesions that show up at the time of slaughter and cause discounting of the carcass. In summer, we know that uh, the, the lesions were showing up from maybe June to September or late, maybe perhaps into October uh, as cosmetic lesions on the bellies and hams. This is the next slide. Some plants are forced to trim them. It's because of the commodity standards. Bellies and hams with, are marketed with skin on, and there's a ceiling, if you will, for the number of lesions or bug bites that are permitted. We took some sections from those in the next slide. Uh, those lesions, you can see they're bright little red dots. That's what they look like coming out of the, of the flamer. Um, and we did uh, um, pathology sections on those, and uh, our pathologists convinced me that, in fact, we're looking at something that's consistent with an insect bite. It's not a pathogen. It isn't uh, something that's, that's transmissible. Rather, it's just a, a, an injury from a mosquito that fed and injected saliva. We worked with the plant to get out to uh, some of the uh, suppliers that were feeding hogs into the plant. Uh, and our survey of suppliers, the next slide shows an open-sided curtain barn, which is really common housing for hogs around Minnesota, and with an adjacent lagoon. And we got out and looked at uh, probably 30 different operations, looked at the animals in the barns, and if you look at the next slide, uh, you see uh, a, a photograph of the side of a pig. You can see the raised pink lesions, just like my kids looked like when they came in from, from playing uh, softball in the evening without wearing their repellent. Remar remarkably similar. We uh, looked in the barns in the next slide, trapped insects to see what was in there biting them. And you can see the hogs laying complacently during the daytime, but in the night, the curtains are down for ventilation, and the mosquitoes, we think, come in from outside. And the next slide is the data slide. It shows that uh, barns that had fewer mosquitoes had smaller numbers of carcasses trimmed or the complement. If you had more mosquitoes, the percentage of the carcasses that got trimmed increased up to maybe 30, 40 percent of the carcasses had to be trimmed. That's serious loss. How to prevent it? What we came around to doing uh, on the next slide is, um, is to realize that this problem is being caused by mosquitoes that are probably coming from neighboring properties, if not farther away. They were not breeding in the manure pits or lagoons outdoors, but rather they were coming in from wetlands, perhaps in the, in the whole surrounding township. The bulk of the mosquitoes that we saw were of a species called Aedes vexans. It's a floodwater mosquito. It's not important, but understand that they develop as larvae, and I'm showing you a little picture of a, of a glass vial with mosquito larvae. We call them wrigglers, and you can see how small they are. They develop in standing water, and a feature of Minnesota and, and Midwest generally is that during the summer, if we get thunderstorms, we get mosquito habitat, and in turn, there's lots of mosquitoes. Anybody who's lived here knows this story. The next slide is number 19. Here I'm, I'm giving you some basic recommendations for, for premise management to try to keep the numbers of mosquitoes that are growing up on your property to a minimum. Any containers that will hold water uh, are, are fair game for mosquitoes to develop in during the summer. So we're talking about cans, tires, any, any sort of rubble or materials like that which will hold a cup of water is enough to produce some mosquitoes locally. Minimize that by getting rid of those containers. Adjacent grounds, grade them if, if at all possible so that it slopes away gently. When water rain or rainfall occurs, then we don't have puddling occurring around on the premise. That's a good thing to do. And finally, if you use a, use a lawnmower uh, to keep vegetation short uh, around the barns, that reduces the harborage areas that mosquitoes will perch in during the daytime and in turn come out and become active at night. Those are things you should be doing. But... Um, past that, there are still likely sources in the neighborhood that you can't control. And in turn, if you uh, have a history of having problems with bug bites, then slide 20 
shows a, a study that I and uh, Scott D and some other vet and vet students did several years back. Um, slide 20 shows on the left hand side a uh, uh, curtain sided barn without fly screen, and then on the right hand side there are, are the curtain sided barn with fly screen over it. You can barely see the difference. This is regular, we use regular fiberglass screen. And anything of, of a, a poor size, about like that, will be enough to keep mosquitoes out. We looked at the numbers of mosquitoes trapped inside each barn, and we got about an 80% reduction by putting up fly screen. We got uh, something like a 60% reduction in the number of house flies that we saw inside the same barns. The flies were coming in from outside, too. And what we were concerned about was that uh, the fly screen would, would uh, block airflow and would make for uh, heat inside those barns. And uh, we didn't have real hot conditions to test this, but during that time, there was a very small but, but satisfactory increase in the temperature. So we sort of think we dispelled the worries of, of fly screens. As an aside, if you use these, they'll be up temporarily and back down, and they're going to need some maintenance uh, because of cotton wood and, and, and other you know, materials blowing around dust will, will block the pores and in turn reduce the, the ventilation that, that would otherwise occur with fly screens. So we think the bug bite problem is really caused by mosquitoes and we've developed a couple of solutions uh, to try to uh, reduce those losses for producers who have a history of that problem. If we return to the next slide, um, the remaining talk is to dis discuss house flies. Uh, and other large flies. These are insects that, that uh, naturally develop in the kinds of materials that we, we that accumulate where hogs are, are confined. And in turn, the key to keeping their numbers acceptably low uh, is to manage them through source reduction, perhaps exclusion in certain situations, uh, and as a backup, premise sprays of insecticides where, where it's really needed. And of course, we'll talk a little bit about how to monitor to see how well your program is going, too. Slide number 22 uh, goes, takes us back to our table of uh, barn flies and their sources. The group in the middle we're talking about are large, what we call filth flies. All of these kinds of flies develop basically in manure and rotting feed of one kind or another. We see some uh, in manure storage systems. We see others outdoors. Uh, it's kind of a mix of substrates. Wherever, wherever the moisture is right for them and the temperature is, is uh, right for them, then we can see different kinds develop. Um, page slide 23 shows several of the common ones that, that I've experienced around uh, hog operations in the Midwest. Um, probably the most abundant one is the house lights, the one top in the center. This is the same insects that shows up in the kitchen if you leave your door open. Very common grows in garbage cans, any sort of place where there's decaying organic matter, this insect is likely to be there. Next to that is stable fly. Uh, this is a biting insect. It bites and takes blood. Uh, I don't normally see it developing around swine operations, but if there's a neighboring beef or dairy feedlot uh, or a, a confinement facility of some kind, they're often producing stable flies that then fly over the fence and will, will, will bite hogs if they can get at them. The bottom three are insects, none of which bite, uh, but they come from filthy habitats and they can be spreading um, microbes, bacteria and viruses and such, uh, as well as do house fly and stable fly. The bottom line is the garbage flies and then blow flies. Uh, garbage flies develop in, in decaying feed mostly, uh, but the blow flies develop in, in carcasses, dead animals. So if the, if the, if the deads aren't taken care of in a, in a quick enough fashion, uh, then blowflies can develop. And of course, they're coming from roadkill and other things in the neighborhood too, so you can't practice uh, complete source reduction to get rid of the blowflies. We know that these, in slide 24, uh, we know that these large fill flies spread, spread pathogens, mainly through mechanical contact. They pick them up, move them, and then drop them from their feet or their mouth parts. Uh, there's a, a list of viruses that, that we know can be transmitted by flies. I've crossed and grayed out hog cholera and pseudorabies, purportedly uh, eradicated from commercial uh, swine operations in the U.S. Um, um, uh, transmissible gastroenteritis, we know can be spread by flies. PERS virus, we've demonstrated, can be spread by, by house flies in particular. 
And uh, TED is a new one on the on the on the on the horizon. We haven't, to my knowledge, nobody studied the flyborne spread of uh, porcine epidemic, the diarrhea virus. But uh, we're certain that that, that it, it, it is an opportunity. And so, if you're concerned about biosecurity for those pathogens, fly control should be high on your list of things to consider. We also know that many kinds of bacteria are transmitted, and they're listed here. We needn't dwell on those. But just basically, you want to minimize the number of these large filth flies around your hogs to minimize the opportunity for them to pick up and spread um, infectious uh, organisms that can affect the health and productivity of your hogs. Slide 25 shows some of the kinds of locations where we can find um, large filth flies developing. Anywhere you can find animals, you bring feed to them. Feed waste can accumulate, and that can produce these flies. Of course, their feces will accumulate, too. If you have good manure management, you'll minimize the numbers of filth flies, particularly house flies uh, in, in confined animal housing. Get outdoors. You can get feed accumulating. Uh, and finally, uh, some of the newer uh, hoop-style barns showing in the lower right-hand corner, uh, we're finding that, that that deep bedding mixed with urine and feces and feed makes for ideal habitat for uh, for what uh, fill flies need to develop. In slide 26, I use the phrase maggot heaven. That's something that I use with the, the vet students that I lecture to, to try to think about or get them to think about where is the best place to grow maggots, where do the, where, where do the fill flies want, uh, what sorts of materials do they do well in. And the answer is the material has to be somewhere between 90 and 30 percent water, that is intermediate moisture content, and it has to be intermediate temperature, about 50 to 110. Organic matter uh, actively fermenting in that moisture level and temperature level is suitable for development of one or the other kinds of, of, of these, of these uh, large filth flies. And in turn, you need to think about where on your place that material could be available. Scout with a trowel in hand to see if you can find active maggots. And I've shown you a picture right in the middle of slide 26 of what these maggots look like. Pointy little heads, round little butts. These guys wiggle, and they're very easy to see. If they're actively breeding somewhere on your place, you should be able to find them with five, ten minutes of scouting time. And in turn, think about how to prevent that from happening, how to intervene somehow. We've done some research uh, with house flies in particular uh, here at Minnesota, again, with some of the veterinarians and vet students on, page, on slide 27. Um, we're sort of summarizing a study, and let me take a minute to walk through here. We have um, a, a research farm the university does out in Appleton, western Minnesota, normally occupied by uh, wild-type houseflies with red eyes. And we used, I actually have a genetic mutant fly in my laboratory that I keep going just for research purposes. They have greenish eyes. And we call them greenies affectionately. And we uh, actually set up hogs with trickle infections of PERS virus at that farm and we released the greeny flies, and then in turn we set up fly-catching traps at different distances from the center farm to see, one, if we could pick up the greenies away from, from the source farm, how far away we could pick them up, and also could we pick up the virus. We were actually using a, 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 a line of PERS virus that we is different from the wild type, so uh, we could tell that it was ours. And the map in the center is diagramming the star, that's the source barn, the black dots are places where Jen Schur, uh placed those bucket or uh, jug traps, and in turn the black ones, black dots that are circled with yellow or sorry red, are ones where we actually picked up the index index strain of the virus. And what that told us is, if you look at the arrow going up, say to uh, 10 or 11 o'clock, uh, that flies could transmit a detectable and infectious PERS virus uh, beyond a mile. The lines, of course, are section lines, so that gives you a sense of scale. Um, there's no question that flies can transmit PERS out from a source barn, and in turn, you need to think about, if you're worried about PERS or anything else, uh, where within a mile flies could be produced and pick up virus and then fly into your place, as shown on slide 28. Or alternatively, if you have an infection and maybe have you have satellite uh, facilities elsewhere, or your neighbors, you're being ethical here, um, how far away your flies could be transmitting your pathogens. At this point, we're thinking generally of a setback of a mile. It's pretty substantial, but a mile, uh, for biosecurity reasons, would be uh, the, the most desirable. 
So there's reason to worry about large field flies. We've done most research with house flies, but we think the same patterns would occur with the other species if we were to be involved with studying them. On slide 29, um, we list some of the general strategies that we encourage people to think about when they're worried about field fly control or concerned with it or trying to achieve it. The first one, and I've mentioned several times uh, already, is to think about sources where flies could be coming from, where they could be developing as maggots, and in turn try to minimize the volume of that or make it uh, inhospitable in one way or another. In other words, kill the maggots and keep them from developing there. Um, indoors, too, don't overlook uh, debris around feeders, waterers mixed with feed if you're using bedding. Anything that can hold moisture in that 30 to 90 percent range is likely to be colonized by field flies, especially if it's if it's uh, contaminated with with feces, manure. Uh, in certain circumstances, sources are, are can't be managed. Uh, you can protect animals behind screens. Uh, fly screen works well to reduce uh, house flies, and I showed you the data a moment ago when we were talking about bug bites. That uh, that 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 works. Not perfect. People come and go through doors and things like that. But still, you can reduce the numbers of flies that are getting in from the outside with fly screens. And then in cases of uh, um, um, emergency, um, residual insect sprays can be used, but they're not a sustainable long-term solution that, that should be relied upon by itself. And lastly, we urge you to monitor. That is, get some measure of abundance of flies, do it routinely, so in turn you have something to look back and think about and decide whether your uh, fill fly management program is adequate. Go to slide 30. Um, we see a scout with trowel and a, and a map. Uh, what she's doing is walking around, uh, searching possible places where maggots could be, uh, where manure accumulates or where feed is handled, looking for active maggots. It's easy to do, uh, and you might make this a part of, of your premise maintenance program. Uh, inspect weekly would be about the right frequency. Do it from spring. Uh, I would say in Minnesota here, we're talking basically June 1st uh, through into October. And again, if you find occupied places, keep track of where they are, and if possible, dispose of them by uh, scraping and hauling weekly. That will work. Spread it on open ground if you have it into fragments about the size of a golf ball or smaller. Uh, that's enough to spread it out and prevent maggots from developing in it. Uh, compost uh, dryer materials, if, if, if that's a, a feasible thing, that will work. Uh, finally, if you could wash materials into liquid storage, like power washing down into the, into the, into the pit below, uh, that's a way to get those solids that are aerobic yet down underwater. These maggots won't develop under the water. And again, if you know where your, your insects, maggots are developing, you can think about chronic problem areas, uh, and, um, and uh, minimize their numbers. A couple of comments on slide 31 about manure management. Um, the ag engineers and I are at, at crosses on this one, too. Uh, they say they want a membrane, if you will, on the surface of the manure to keep the odors from, from emanating. I find that if there is, a, is, a, is a, a membrane on the surface, and I don't mean fabric, I mean dried solids agglomerated, if those, if those solids are there, the maggots will find them and will have uh, ooh, buku uh, numbers of, of, of house flies in particular developing from liquid storage systems. In the lower right-hand corner, you'll see uh, a better managed lagoon, uh, but you have to be careful to watch around the edges where the solids are present. Somewhere in there from wet to dry is maggot heaven, and during the summer you'll find both, both uh, stable flies and house flies developing in that kind of substrate. Don't overlook indoors, too, on slide 32. Uh, basic solids management will, will work for large fill flies and also the small, the pit gnats I was talking about. Trying to get those materials down under the surface of the water to make them unavailable for developing flies. Again, power washing is possible between lots of hogs. Uh, and at time of pumping, if you can agitate, if you have a history of, of, um, of solids developing in the pit, uh, get them removed so that you don't have that, that uh, floater, those floaters in there. Coming to the end, after thinking about uh, source reduction on, on 33, uh, you still may be surrounded by people that are producing more flies, and in turn, your, your adult flies on your premise are actually coming from neighboring operations. And in this case, fallbacks could include screening, as, done, as I mentioned earlier, 
or also insecticidal sprays can be put where flies perched. Um, and a little bit more about that in a moment. Uh, we do know from national surveys that uh, house flies are notoriously resistant to different kinds of insecticides. This is an inherited trait. It's a result of past history of heavy usage. We have a large number of chemicals that worked in the past and no longer work simply because the insects have evolved the ability to uh, detoxify or avoid them. And so at this point, our basic recommendation is to minimize as much as possible the, the need for insecticides through sanitation. And if you do need them, uh, rotate between classes of chemicals with different modes of action. Uh, that is, for example, an organophosphate and a pyrethroid. Uh, use them alternately, not together, but maybe alternate months if you have to use them. And uh, that seems to be the most best, best recipe we have now to slow down resistance. Uh, it won't it won't prevent it, but it will slow it down. On slide 34, you can see a fellow is spraying the uh, the, the, the 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 edges of the pens uh, with a residue. You want to try to get either with either kinds of material uh, where flies perch, and you can find those places by looking for fly specks. Um, you'll you'll see uh, overhead vertical surfaces. Uh, they, they don't spend much time on the floor. You're wasting your materials by spraying the floor, but, but work on vertical and overhead surfaces where flies will perch, and in turn, you'll get m the most mileage out of them. In dusty environments, like the hog barns that I've been in for a couple of decades, uh, you should not expect the insecticide to work for more than a week, perhaps two weeks. Um, and uh, if it's really dusty, it'll be even shortened there. Don't look over uh, outlook the outside, too. Don't overlook the outdoors. Um, slide 35, I'm showing you the, the, the side of a barn. Think about where flies perch. Look under the eaves, for example, and on the walls. When it's cold, they'll bask on the sunny sides of the barns. When it's hot, they'll perch in the shady sides. So think about how weather changes where these insects go. And in turn, if you're spraying, you can target your residues for those kinds of places. Last point here, uh, having to do with filth flies, is... Uh, you should have in your program the management for your individual premise, some records of how well or poorly your program is working. Somehow uh, monitor for the abundance of flies. There's a variety of ways to do this. In slide 37, uh, we show some of the commonly used techniques. Uh, people will walk with sticky tapes. Um, some, some other operations, particularly poultry operators, will put up spot cards this is a white surface. The flies will perch on them, leave their specks, and in turn you can scan and count the numbers of specks. Beta jug traps work um, or sticky traps work. These are four commonly used options for measuring flies. The idea is to put them up or do it at a, at a specific and regular interval, count the numbers captured, and the numbers caught is, is a measure of how, um, how abundant flies are in the area. It's really not important what method you use. What is important is that you use it routinely uh, and basically have a monitoring program in place when temperatures or location are above 50, which is about the flight threshold for these flies. There's no point in trapping when it's cold. The flies are grounded. They may be there, but they're grounded. Um, so in Minnesota, at least, we're talking about you know during the summer months from, say, June to uh, into October. Okay. To recap here, I tried to make three points in response to things that um, participants said they were interested in. I hope I succeeded. Pit gnats are fruit flies and moth flies that bother people. Work on source reduction. Mosquitoes, uh, exclusion really is the most important thing for, for market-ready hogs. Other hogs, you don't need to worry about it. Uh, mosquitoes. And then finally, fill flies or other large flies can, can bother people and spread pathogens. They should be part of your premise management program. Uh, to be added to all of the other things. Okay, I've given you my email address here. Um, if you wish to send questions independently or stick around for uh, the end of this Pork Bridge session, um, I'd be happy to answer them. And at that way, I'll uh, pass the microphone back to uh, Sarah, is it? Thank you once again, Roger. And now with that, I'm going to hand it over to John Beller with Beller Biosecurity Strategies Incorporated to cover the rodent portion of our Pork Bridge session today. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for inviting me to speak with you this afternoon. Um, I very much appreciate the uh, fact that 
many of you have had extensive training in animal biology, and I'd ask that you would bear with me on the subject that uh, may be viewed as old hat to some uh, areas. I'll tie the science and the practical together as we move forward. Today I'll present across three topics. Uh, the first would be on slide three, understanding the commensals. Slide four, the cost of putting up a threats in mice and new systems and sustained solutions. The commensals arrived on early trade ships from China and inhabited the eastern seaboard and quickly spread west with the early pioneers and settlers. Uh, today you can find the commensals across the 48 contiguous states and Alaska, save for the roof route, which is mostly confined to the eastern seaboard, southern coastal states up into Arkansas, and the west coast of California, Oregon, and Washington State. Today, populations, whether small or of serious consequences, are everywhere. They're in our large metro cities, in our million-dollar suburban homes, and certainly on the agricultural setting. Commensal rats and mice belong to the family of Muridae, which means to share at the table, literally. There are over 1,700 species of rodents uh, that are not commensal, and there are three commensals that are important worldwide. And they are the house mouse. Its binomial name is Mus musculus, the Norway rat, Rattus nubiscus, and the roof rat, Rattus rattus. Mice and rats reproduce rapidly. They have relatively short lifespans, about 18 months in a laboratory situation, less in a natural environment. Commensals have short gestation and rapid sexual maturity. And their numbers only increase with adequate food and water and shelter. Mice can become sexually active at in as little as five weeks, reproducing up to eight times in their lifespan, and their litter size is four to seven pups. Using that math, they're responsible for about 56 offspring annually. No way roof rats become sexually mature and able to mate at eight to 12 weeks. They both have about the same litters per year. However, their litter size vary. The Norway 8 to 12 pups, where the roof rat is 4 to 8 pups. Slide 14. Rodents are excellent jumpers, swimmers, and climbers. Uh, a mouse can do a vertical of about 18 inches, a uh, rat about 36 inches, and that's both vertical and uh, across also. They're great swimmers and excellent climbers too. Some rodents may never touch the, the base floor. If they live in, in the ceiling, for example, and that's a nesting area, they might migrate down uh, through the wall over to their food source area and come back and up into the nesting area, which we call the home range. And they can scale 5, 10, 15 foot just as easily as you and I can take two or three steps forward. On slide 15, understanding the biological and behavioral characteristics of rodents enable us to correctly identify them, and then it also allows us to develop an understanding which lends to the building of management programs, and it also espouses an appreciation for why rodents are such persistent in economic tests. Now today we don't have a whole lot of time to spend on the rodent skills and characteristics, but I'd like to touch uh, just briefly on the incisors, uh, which is uh, indicative of the rodent. Um, so they're the, they have a, a two pair, the upper and lower incisors, which they uh, constantly chisel and file down to each other. And they supplement this activity by chewing on twigs, wood, electrical wires, or what have you. The tail is kind of interesting. It's important um, for identification and also use-wise. And uh, the tail edge or the fur is very important. Uh, just a couple of things that come to mind is, one, it protects them from hot and cold. And so during the, the cold winters that we just came out from, for example, we as humans, we walk around and the soles of our shoes absorb most of that cold, where they have a lot more body surface to uh, floor surface. And so you can see how they would deplete a lot more energy. And for an animal of small prey, it's important that they conserve that energy. Also, we find the hairs, at the, if you look uh, closely between the ears and on the back and on the sides also, we have what we call vibrissae. And that vibrissae is for... Well, anybody that's my age, 60 year old, you might remember the curb finders on the old Cadillacs. It's kind of a sensor, if you will. Um, the commensals can be found everywhere, on riverbanks, open fields and metal, and near structures. You can see a burrow right there in the center. Uh, they do quite well without our help. 
uh, this is a uh, situation where a client of uh, ours contacted us to uh, help them eliminate this uh, uh, Norway rat colony. And you can see in the foreground, the population is so heavy that it actually uh, collapsed the, the, the bank. And then in the background here, you can see carcasses that should have been lined and covered with dirt and litter and debris that could have otherwise been handled. And then in the background, you can see all the, the burls. Um, so what I did on this situation is, uh, number one, you have to remember with rats in particular that they're neophobic. And so they don't like a lot of change in their environment. So what I'm going to do on this, uh, this scenario is take care of the activity first, then we're going to do the cleanup later. And so what I did in the afternoon, I just took rid of a paper napkin and inserted in as many of the burrows as I could, probably hit every three or, or fourth burrow. And I came back later on that afternoon, and I had discovered that the napkins weren't pushed out, nor were they blown around by the wind. Rather, they were pulled into the burrow, uh, used probably for uh, nesting frenzies. And so then, seeing the activity of this, uh, this colony, I went ahead and I baited that evening. And I, again, uh, tried to get as many burrows as I could, and I came back the next morning, and 100% of the bait was consumed. So I went ahead and rebaited, came back the next day, and about 85% of the bait was consumed. Come back on a third day after rebaiting again, and most of the bait was left over at this point in time. So we just kind of observed the, the burrows in the pit in general for the next four or five days until we were convinced that there was some more activity, and then we put in a request to have it properly cleaned up and covered. Next slide, number 20. This is the site that uh, we had here in the Midwest. A client called us up. It was uh, about a 60 or 80,000 uh, cell finisher, a hog finisher, and um, it was in bankruptcy. And so um, if you look on the curtain, that's all mice lining up in there, uh, playing and dancing uh, to the left and right of those uh, studs. And... Uh, the building, as I recall, is about 265 foot long, so and this is by day, 2 o'clock in the afternoon. I walked from the entry to the back and, and to the entry again and counted over 650 live mice. So it just kind of gives you an idea of how severe the population was in this environment. Now going to the next uh, topic, cost of putting up with commensals. So foodborne illnesses, when we hear words on TV and radio such as E. coli or salmonella, uh, the industry, the, the pork industry takes a hit for this. When we hear of uh, animal uh, welfare, whether uh, real or, or perceived, uh, we take a hit as an industry. So good business practices are very important, and road control is one of these. Keeping meds in check. Maintaining herd health through prevention of disease agents. There again, a good solid pest management program is important here. The following is some of the, the uh, diseases that can be spread by rodents and swine facilities here in North America. Okay, so when I get a call and I make an appointment to go out to a site, uh, I go in there, I have a clean truck, I have my proper downtime, I send in on the registry, shower in, go over to the quarantine area, pick up my supplies, visit my pig troll, and then I shower out. And as I leave, we all agree that we have file security. On the picture on the right-hand side, we see this little fella going through a squeeze point of about a quarter of an inch. We have no idea what his tail has been dragging through, what's in his fur, what's on his foot pad, or his saliva, or in a dropping. Yet, just a few minutes ago up front, we all agreed that we have mild security. Uh, Grumpy the cat um, isn't the answer today. Uh, probably never was. Ten confirmed uh, viral pathogens, including Toxoplasma, Campylobacter, and Salmonella, are associated with the cat. Here we have structural damage off the left-hand side, uh, except after 5, 10, 12 years of service, blowing out in the wind and weather, uh, this can happen. We can have damage to the curtains. But off to the right-hand side, uh, totally unacceptable. What probably happened is we had a situation much like today, starting to warm up outside. We dropped the curtains. There's no maintenance program, no inspection. And uh, when we put them back up in the fall, uh, we discovered that we had several nesting areas where rodents had done some damage. So... Um, being a simple man, just using simple math, if this building was, uh, say, 265 foot long, maybe 6 to $8 uh, cost of goods, um, 10 to $12 maybe for labor, 10 buildings, 
you're looking at about $25,000 of unnecessary expenditure. There's some more damage off the left-hand side on, pay, on slide 27. We have some insulation. In all fairness, uh, some of this was done by insects, crickets, and other bugs. But you can see the, the black droppings in there. And what that tells me is there's an absence of, of a bait or toxic in this area. When a rodent consumes, be it a red or a green bait, it will defecate that same color dye. And so as I look at the black, I can see that we have no bait in this environment. But sometimes this is what happens when we use just the old tradition method versus good solid science. Uh, tradition would say you start here and then go out 50 foot, and then there's another station, another 50 foot, another station, and so on. Whereas if we would go ahead and introduce uh, the bait in the areas where there's traffic, pathways, pheromones, those types of situations, we would find that we would be more effective uh, and have less damage. Off to the right-hand side, uh, a mouse has a, a burrow of about an inch, inch and a quarter, usually irregular in diameter. This is more round, around two and a quarter, two and a half inches, which is indicative of a Norway rat. Um, I've seen situations before where the earth was so undermined uh, that the uh, top foundation had collapsed from the weight of the livestock up above. Employee relations, this is totally out of my realm. However, these are some of the things that we hear, is that when it comes to um, rats and mice and uh, German cockroaches and, and flies, as Roger had mentioned earlier, uh, they're just frustrated and want, uh, the, the, the employees want them just to go away. And there's health issues associated with this, too. There's allergens and asthma. Uh, once we find a good individual uh, to, to suit that need inside the facility, uh, we want to have a, a tenured employee out of that individual. And, and this is one way that we can do it is by listening to that concern and giving a better work environment. So uh, the last topic then would be sustained solutions. Uh, this is just a nice, simple paragraph. Uh, integrated test management, IPM, as an effective and environmentally sensitive approach to test management that relies on common sense practice. And the key word there is common sense again. Uh, what we've done at Dollar Bio Security is boiled that down to a simple acronym of CDS, Continued Education, Verification of the Effectiveness of that Education, and then Sustainability, making sure that someone is held accountable for that process and driving that value home each and every month. This uh, next form on slide 31, it's a simple form that would help us uh, to that process. So on the left-hand side of that solid gold line, we would uh, indicate what we saw, where we uh, noticed it, who recorded it, and put a date on that. On the right-hand side would be the action, what action was taken by that employee at that point in time, date that. This form would then be sent to our office where we would evaluate it and then, if necessary, make a prescriptive a diagnosis. So IPM, what are the components? Identification. Sanitation, exclusion, trapping, and or baiting. Identification again on slide 33. Uh, on top is a roof rat, and I apologize, these aren't the greatest pictures. But it's a roof rat. You can see it's got a longer tail, slender build, big ears. Uh, it, it looks like a clamor. On the bottom, you have the Norway rat, a little more haunched in the rear, shorter tail, small ears, and bigger foot pads. And it's a digger. That's what it does. And also the right-hand right side is just the variance between the house mouse and the young rat. You can see the head and body in general is a little bit uh, bigger on the rat and the tail maybe shorter. Proper identification of evidence on the left-hand side. Uh, we see the fly casings. Uh, has, it looks like uh, wooden droppings from, from a distance, quarter of an inch in length. And when we get a little bit closer, we discover they are fly casings. On the right-hand side, you can see we have mouse droppings over here. And if you look on that piece of concrete in the center from left to right, it's kind of a dark, shadowy area. And uh, what that is is an a, a oily deposit uh, from the sebaceous glands. And uh, that's a, a, an oil that protects the skin and the, the fur of the rodent. And as the rodent goes through its environment, it collects dust and seeds and so on and so forth, those deposits are made uh, wherever it goes into its squeeze points and its nest and area and its pathways and so on. So it kind of gives us an idea of, of what our level of activity is in those areas. And you can also see that, again, you have the black droppings in the center and off the side there's a few green ones. 
And so that means that they went ahead and ingested the toxicant, and it's probably a second-generation rodenticide, which means they need just one feeding, and it's a, it's a, a lethal dosage. On the left-hand side of uh, slide 35, you can see that we have a big crop of weeds growing, all the seed heads. Uh, mice are seed eaters. This is just a haven. Uh, first thing we should do is mow this down, uh, uh, burn it off of the herbicide, and then uh, mow a, a good distance uh, away from the, the facility also and maintain that throughout the growing season. On the right-hand side, you can see that, uh, that there's a separation of the sidewall, and uh, that's what rodents do. They look for those shadow areas, those lines. Their senses are excellent senses. They can smell the food in there. They can sense the, the temperature variances, and this is where you would find them along the perimeter of the building. The rock tree zone on the left-hand side, you can see the one was being installed here. However, uh, what was uh, done improperly is they didn't go with an even-sized aggregate. Uh, some of these were actually the size of a football a football helmet, and so what it did is created that dark shadow which invited the rodents into that environment, and uh, and we did sustain some damage uh, in the curtains as a result of that. On the right-hand side, you can see that this is a, a properly installed rock bio zone. Um, this is post-construction, but uh, normally you would burn off all your weeds with the herbicide and then lay your rock foundation. Um, and then place your bait stations strategically down the lane. On the left-hand side of uh, slide 37, you can see in the bottom 90, that's a squeeze point. A quarter of an inch is enough to allow a mouse entry and half inch for a rat. So this is the, the uh, call to seal, uh, a minimum, have a bait station on the outside, maybe a monitor on the inside. Uh, and off to the right-hand side, you can see that the entire sweep or threshold has been destroyed, and this is just a... Uh, invitation uh, for rodents to enter. On slide 38, we have proper exclusion practices. You can see the tinning and caulking on the left-hand side. Screening on the right side, that's just ideal. You can see at the bottom on uh, the portals that uh, it's a quarter-inch screen to prevent mice from getting in. You've got some hog wire up there to keep the predators out. You've got the bird screen. The only thing we're missing is what Roger spoke to earlier would be uh, some screening to keep the flies out. Clean up a feed spills. Uh, this is a big pile of uh, feed. We haven't seen uh, much of this since the uh, corn got up to a high of $5 at one point in time, but it was typical one. It was a buck 90 at harvest. Uh, so remedy on that, again, is just uh, sweeping it up and disposing of it properly, and it's not uh, just taking it across the road and dumping it. And, uh, that creates problems uh, that way. On slide 40, clutter and debris. Uh, pick it up, remove it, get rid of it, recycle it. On the right-hand side, we have a picture-perfect uh, environment. You can see that we have a nice urban cut of the vegetation, three to five inches, and it's maintained throughout the summer. A nice rock bile zone. We have our bait station strategically placed. We have some burrowing uh, along the building there at the base, and that's uh, a larger predator uh, looking for uh, a quick meal. And so we'll try to fill in those holes, or if nothing else, we have to set some live traps to control the uh, predators. Um, on slide 41, mechanical catch traps. Um, the, uh, the one on the left-hand side is a wind-up trap that works off a paddle system, catching 8 to 15 mice per setting. On the right-hand side, it's just a, a, a fulcrum or a, a, a leverage type of trap uh, works well to catch mice. On the left-hand side, not as practical as the snap trap uh, in the office area, combined areas. They work well. I like the one on the right-hand side. I can put a zip strap on that and put it on a, a pipe or a tube mean, uh, somewhere where I have that stubborn uh, road that I just can't seem to, to uh, get, get in to eat my bait. Those work real well. Here we have a tamper-proof bait station. Uh, this this is uh, properly loaded. Um, if I was to guess, uh, the bait on the left-hand side is green in color, uh, maybe a bromethalone, L-O-N-E. And uh, that would be an anticoagulant. On the right-hand side, the, the red bait would indicate maybe a bromethylene LIN, which would be an acute bait. Uh, upper left-hand, that's a, a pellet bait. Uh, that'd be what I used on the uh, the pit example earlier. Um, and on the right-hand bottom, it would be our soft bait search or uh, the rage right now these days. Um, it's got an oil, a vegetable oil added to it. <clears throat> which the uh, rodents really uh, seem to enjoy in their diet. On slide 45, uh, we need to uh, maintain a fresh 
supply of bait. Uh, on the right hand side, you can see it's just overkill. It's better to put out uh, four, six, uh, eight uh, blocks and see what we have for activity. And as it reduces, it tells you what kind of activity you have. Uh, other than that, it's just a waste of money. On the left-hand side, is just uh, in both cases, just poor rotation. Uh, we only have um, just a handful of uh, toxicant classes out there, so we need to make sure that we rotate properly uh, so that we don't lose any of these. On the upper left-hand corner, you can see, again, it's bad rotation. Um, and if you look closer on that uh, 2 by 8 or 6, uh, those are fly specs, so if they, they miss that diagnosis, it's fine. On the right-hand side, you can see there's good rotation. Uh, looks like they went with a, uh, maybe a bromethalone or the, the bluish-green bait. Uh, you can see the black droppings and some colored green droppings there, and then they went ahead and they switched to another class of bait. So on slide number 48, this is where the rubber hits the road. The question I guess we have to ask is, do you have the proper training, proper skill sets, and a discipline place to provide IPM at your food facilities? Um, again, if you look at this facility here, um, a good question is to ask yourself, you know, where do I start? But again, by understanding the past, being able to identify it, knowing its habits, uh, knowing a, a little bit about its uh, characteristics, uh, you can kind of nail that down. When you have an all-in, all-out situation, it's easier. You take all the food sources away, and then you can go ahead and, and relatively with ease, uh, become pestering in the environment from a standpoint of rodents. However, if it's a gestation barn or, or something of this nature where you're not uh, all in, all out, uh, it's more of a harvesting kind of a process. So the bottom line is this. Biosecurity cannot be assured if rodents are tolerated in and around swine facility. Pest control needs to be a part of the biosecurity discussion. Thank you very much for your time. And uh, I'll be back with you here just at the question answer period. All right. Thank you, John, for your presentation on on rodents today. Thank you. And, and once again, thank you so much for the two of you um, presenting on your given topics. Um, I found them to be to be great and a lot of applied um, information that that our participants can can readily apply to the facilities that they that they work in. So thank you again for um, being our presenters today and um, being accommodating of each other and, and sharing the time. So thank you again for doing that. And I would like to thank our Port Bridge participants as well for joining us today. So with that, this concludes our session for today. And thank you, participants, for joining us. <laughs>